Thank you. If you read the book, uh, you, you'll miss the French accent. Uh, <laughs> so this morning you have the, the book and the French accent. And they, uh, they, they, as uh, Brian uh, just explained, I mean, the, the purpose of the book uh, is to, to show, to demonstrate that the, uh, economics is a science and that free market works. And the uh, free, uh, it, it is a science, which it's, it's a quite a recent science. Uh, if we look back into history, uh, you had extraordinary men uh, who, had, who had extraordinary intuitions, like uh, Milton, um, Stuart, uh, uh, Adam Smith, sorry, explained more than two centuries ago that the free trade was good. Uh, but it was more like an intuition. Uh, what is quite recent in economics as a science is that most of uh, the uh, most of our arguments and certainly most of the arguments in this book are based on facts facts what uh, facts that we can measure uh, we now uh, work on data uh, we build mathematical model we confront the mathematical model with economic reality and we know and uh, we know if the model is right or the model is wrong it's demonstrated wrong we build a new model and so on so uh the um uh economics works as a science uh since quite a recent period uh, when I, I started studying economics and even teaching economics it was very much a matter of opinion uh people would think that free trade was good and other people would think that free trade was bad and uh, uh, some would uh, advocate inflation as a way to create growth, for example. It was before Milton Friedman. And they, uh, so it was a matter of discussion. And uh, uh, until the late 70s, uh, economists would compare uh, the efficiency of the Soviet model versus the capitalist model. And some would argue that the uh, communist model was more efficient, or more egalitarian, and because we didn't have the data. Uh, when we started having the data, um, well, it, economics uh, stopped being a matter of opinion, and it became a scientific matter. So when I say economics is a science and uh, a free market works better, um, it's not because it's my opinion or it's because it's my choice. Uh, yeah, it is a fact. And I would say most of the economists work now uh, within, this, uh, within this framework. So the, uh, the, uh, the role of economics and the role of economists uh, today um, is to try to define what is a good economic policy versus a bad economic policy. So economics is a way to make the distinction. And uh, I argue that uh, we are today in a position to make this distinction. We know what works and we know what doesn't work. Of course, what works doesn't work perfectly uh, because we are human beings. And as human beings, we have uh, passions and we make sometimes irrational decisions and there are parameters that we do not control. But basically, within the parameter we control, we know more or less uh, how to define a good economic policy. What is a good economic policy? A good economic policy is a policy which brings uh, people out of poverty. And if they are out of poverty, which is the case in the United States or Western uh, Europe, a good economic policy is a policy which improves uh, the opportunities for people to uh, and more opportunities and more freedom of choice, as Milton Friedman said. Uh, so the criteria are very clear. The criteria are very clear. So what works? Basically, uh, six, six principles, and I have no time to elaborate, but six principles which will seem very evident uh, today and which were not that evident, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, the first uh, principle on which mean, I think most of the economists today would agree, and beyond free market economists, that the, 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 uh, the root basis of growth is entrepreneurship. And without the entrepreneur, you have no growth. And you have entrepreneurs because um, you have uh, circumstances, political and legal circumstances, which uh, allow people uh, to take initiative, uh, like the rule of law, a reasonable tax system, and the respect of property. If you destroy the basis of entrepreneurship, and if you destroy private property, if you don't have a rule of law because there's a failed state or unpredictable state, and you don't have entrepreneurship and you have no growth, it is as simple as that. And um, this, of course, has been very often described, but more as an intuition than uh, by facts. Now we have facts, we can compare, we can compare countries where entrepreneurship has been destroyed, 
uh, by the third, in the name of communism, in the name of third, where entrepreneurship has been destroyed, rule of law has been erased, private property has been destroyed, taxes have been too high, uh, entrepreneurship has disappeared, and as a consequence, you have no growth. Uh, the second principle, uh, which is also extremely uh, important, is the uh, innovation. Um, innovation is the only engine for growth. There is no other uh, engine for growth than innovation. So once you have said that, you have not gone very, very far. Uh, so you need to go a little bit further, like for entrepreneurship, and to try to understand what are the conditions for innovation. And the, the United States are a pioneer in innovation since more than one century because of the very uh, specific conditions, uh, which is basically um, the relationship, the close relationship between the university, the academics, and the business community. Uh, this is quite unique in the world. And uh, um, uh, if you look at fundamental research or uh, fundamental science, I mean, uh, you have other places which are as good um, at the United States, I mean, the Europe and Japan, uh, but there is no place where the connection uh, between the business community and the academic co community is as close, as narrow as it is uh, here. And as long the United States will be able to keep this connection, this relationship between the academic world and the business world, I think the United States will be the leader uh, in terms of innovation. Uh, many other countries, France, for example, or South Korea right now, uh, are trying to build this kind of connection, but it's quite complicated, it's rooted in history, in the culture of, uh, of these people. Um, so, you know, I, I read all the um, columns and books about the uh, United States losing its edge in terms of innovation. I see no risk there, as long as you keep uh, the circumstances which I just described. The, the third principle, um, and I want to uh, elaborate, is to, to have a predict stable and predictable uh, money, a predictable uh, currency. Uh, this is absolutely evident today. It was not the case. I mentioned that in my introduction. Uh, we do remember that was in the late 70s, the Brazilian model, where it was explained and shared by many economists all around the world, that by creating uh, more money, even through hyperinflation, uh, you could bring faster growth. And this was a, uh, a common wisdom, largely accepted, I mean, until Milton Friedman demonstrated it was wrong, and also until experience, experimentation, demonstrated that it was wrong. So economics, like any uh, science, work uh, on two legs, I mean, the uh, um, uh, fundamental abstract theory and also the verification of the theory. So this has been the case as far as inflation uh, is concerned. And one of the most remarkable move, positive moves in 30 years is that most of the countries uh, all around the world, they have created independent central banks. And they, in most of the cases, these independent central banks have been able uh, uh, to guarantee to the people <coughs> that the currency would be stable and predictable um, this is one of the reasons, for example, uh, why uh, many countries in Africa uh, which were mired into poverty uh, started growing. And, uh, and the real growth and the main explanation has been uh, the, the monetary stability. Before monetary stability in countries like Burkina Faso or Mali or elsewhere, I mean, people, of course, had no interest in investing in the future because there was no future. And since they have a stable currency, these countries, all conditions remaining the same, um, these countries started to grow uh, because they understood um, the principle number three. Uh, principle number four is the free trade, I mean, the, all economists without exceptions, and I'm talking about economists, not about politicians, different job, all economists do agree that uh, free trade is, is, a, is essential and is positive, so it has been demonstrated by theory and by practice. The question is, uh, why is it that uh, non-economists are still uh, sometimes against free trade? Um, it has to do... Um, uh, with one of the characteristics of economics, and one, it has to do with also uh, um, with the fact that economics is not a popular science. People do not like economists, and people do not like economics, and you understand why. Uh, will you, uh, economists work globally. We say free trade is good for, for you, for you as a group, for you as a nation. But if you happen to be a worker, 
uh, in an industry uh, which will disappear uh, because of Chinese or a, a competition, um, uh, to, uh, to hear that free trade is good for you is completely irrelevant.